Epicurus was the first real philosopher of happiness. There were philosophers before him who talked a lot about the good life, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Diogenes, but they all talked about it in terms of virtue or goodness. Epicurus, much like ourselves, thought of happiness as the highest goal of life. He was a philosophical hedonist, believing that pleasure was the key to unriddling the happy life. The living philosophy of Epicurus is elegantly simple and can be summarised in the Epicurean four-part cure and that's what we're going to be looking at in this episode of The Living Philosophy. Epicurus was born on the Greek island of Samos. He was the son of a schoolmaster and this middle class background made him the source of disdain and derision among the ancient philosophers who were almost exclusively aristocracy. After spending some years teaching in different places around the eastern Mediterranean, Epicurus moved to his parents' hometown Athens and there he set up his school of philosophy in what was known as the Garden of Epicurus, which had an inscription on the gate saying, Stranger, here you will do well to tarry. Here our highest good is pleasure. He spent the rest of his life in Athens teaching, writing, living his best life and developing and spreading his philosophy. The life of the Garden School was the model for later Epicurean settlements. It's like the movement towards communities that we've seen a lot of since the counterculture of the 60s. The idea was to live in a self-sufficient manner, growing your own food and living a simple life with your friends. And friendship for Epicurus was one of the most important things in life. This theme comes up a lot in the bits of writings we have left from. The noble man is most involved with wisdom and friendship, of which one is a mortal good, the other immortal. Of the things which wisdom provides for the blessedness of one's whole life, by far the greatest is the possession of friendship. As well as friendship and self-sufficiency, Epicurus' living philosophy was about the life that was most pleasurable, or more accurately, it was about living the life with the least amount of pain and suffering. To attain this goal of ataraxia, freedom from pain, Epicurus devised his fourfold cure that a later Epicurean Philodemus summarised as, don't fear God, don't worry about death, what's good is easy to get and what's terrible is easy to endure. The Epicurean attitude towards God was that we had nothing to worry about. For those who fear punishment in the afterlife or the wrath of the gods, they should put it out of their minds. He wasn't an atheist, but in essence his attitude was similar. There is no god that created this cosmos and is giving it their undivided attention. For Epicurus, the gods were perfect beings living in conditions and an attitude suitable to that perfection. He argued that it was inconsistent with the concept of divinity to think that the gods cared about such petty affairs as our own. The most suitable way to think of them was in a state of bliss without any cares, without any needs, invulnerable to harm. The gods aren't something to be feared, but something to be emulated. And Epicurus said that if you live the Epicurean way, you will live as a god among men. For a man who lives among mortal goods is in no respect like a mere mortal animal. Epicurus was a follower of Democritus' theory of atomism, which we looked at in a previous episode on the channel, and he believed that there was a lot of value in studying the natural world in what we would now call a scientific way. Understanding the mechanics of the world helps us to overcome our superstitions and see that the cosmos is governed by mechanical laws rather than being puppeteered by a god. The second aspect of Epicurus's living philosophy is the cultivation of the proper attitudes towards death. Many people feel a lot of anxiety about death. For some it's fear of punishment in the afterlife, but the first part of the cure should deal with those anxiety, while for others the fear of death is to do with the fear of their non-existence. Epicurus seeks to put the mind to rest on this by saying that death the most frightening of bad things is nothing to us, since when we exist, death is not yet present, and when death is present, then we do not exist. So death will always be irrelevant to us because by its very definition, we are not present when it is present. Another brilliant point he makes here is by asking us if we remember any pain from the time before we were born. Obviously that's an absurd thought, and so he says that since we have no problem with endless non-existence on one end of our life, why should we fear it on the other? As a materialist and a hedonist, the equation is simple for Epicurus. All pain and all pleasure, all good and all bad, come from sense experience. Since death is the absence of sense experience, it is neither painful nor pleasurable, it's just irrelevant. And if philosophy is, as some have said, the art of dying, then Epicurus is one of the true greats. Despite bitter hatred being cast towards him and his school by the other ancient schools of philosophy, he was still admired for the manner in which he died. He died a slow and painful death from a kidney stone blocking his urinary tract, but despite the prolonged pain involved, he was reported as saying in a letter to Edomeneus, I have written this letter to you on a happy day to me. 
which is also the last day of my life. For I have been attacked by a painful inability to urinate, and also dysentery, so violent nothing can be added to the violence of my sufferings. But the cheerfulness of my mind, which comes from the recollection of all my philosophical contemplation, counterbalances all these afflictions. It's always great to see a philosopher who not only talks the talk, but also walks the walk, and it's something that even the staunchest detractors of Epicurus admired in him. It's a lesson I think we can all learn from and strive to emulate in our own living philosophies. Okay, so the final two parts of the Epicurean four-part cure complement each other like a yin and yang. The first tells us that what is good, pleasure, is easy to attain, and what is bad, pain and suffering, is easy to endure. The first part is the hedonistic core of Epicurus's philosophy. The nature of this hedonism was warped by his contemporaries, and this warping has survived into the modern English definition of an Epicurean as a person devoted to sensual enjoyment, especially that derived from fine food and drink. But as we shall see, this conception is completely off base. Though all pleasure is good for Epicurus, not all pleasures were made equal. He divides them into three different categories. The natural and necessary, the natural but not necessary, and the vain pleasures. The first of these is what he's talking about when he says that what we need is easy to get. These are the simple pleasures, food, shelter, safety, and water. These things are easy to hand and you can get them with little effort or money. The second category are like variations on the first. They provide a variety of pleasure, but they don't really remove the feeling of pain. So things like expensive food and booze are things that are natural but not really necessary. Sex would also go into this category for Epicurus. The third category are the vain pleasures like fame and power, that unlike the natural pleasures are not limited by a satisfiable appetite. The desire for them does not go away by getting a little. There's just never enough of them to go around and even those with a lot will still be hungry for more. So when you're setting out to live the happy life, you don't just say yes to every pleasure that comes your way. The goal is not to maximise pleasure but to minimise pain. A little food and water keep away the pains of hunger and thirst. Figuring out what path leads to the least pain is the most important thing and that's why for Epicurus, the highest virtue in life is prudence. It's even more important than philosophy for him. Sometimes a pleasure can lead to more pain and sometimes a little pain now can lead to more pleasure later. And so prudence is the virtue that guides us in choosing the right course that leads us to the most pleasurable life. You can really see that Epicureanism was this fertile soil for the utilitarianism of Bentham and John Stuart Mill to grow out of later. By satisfying the natural and necessary pleasures, we give our bodies what they need. And as for our souls, all they need is the confidence that our bodies will get what they need. When you know that your body has what it needs and you're confident that your body will continue to have what it needs, then you will be cheerful, and that is the key to enjoying the pleasures of life. Epicurus calls cheerfulness the limit of pleasure. The essence of the Epicurean attitude towards pleasure is learning the art and discipline of recognising how little you need. To enjoy possessing it, enjoy the confidence you will continue to possess it. This doesn't mean swearing off all luxury. In fact, Epicurus says that those who least need extravagance enjoy it most. And in one of my favourite lines from him, he says in a letter to a friend, Send me a pot of cheese so that I may have a feast when I care to. Simple pleasures without anxiety. That's the essence of the Epicurean good life. Once you remove the fear of the gods and of death, then it's about meeting the needs of the body and of the soul. We've looked at the pleasure side of the equation, now let's talk about pain. The fourth and final piece of the puzzle in the Epicurean philosophy of living is that what is terrible is easy to endure. He argued that sickness is either brief or chronic, and either mild or intense. Most acute pains don't last very long, and chronic pains tend to cause only mild distress. Discomfort that is chronic and intense is very unusual. As we've seen, Epicurus himself died after two weeks of excruciating pain caused by kidney stones. But he died cheerfully, because he kept in mind the memory of his friends and the agreeable experiences and conversations they had had together. In comparison to physical pain, mental suffering is agony to endure. But once you embrace the Epicurean philosophy, then you should be released from it, and you won't have to face it again as it contains the cure for anxiety. That's everything that I wanted to say about the living philosophy of Epicurus, but before we wrap up, I thought it would be interesting to reflect on the legacy of this man's thinking, the legacy of his living philosophy in our modern world. One of America's foremost founding fathers and its third president, Thomas Jefferson, was an Epicurean. The mark of Epicurean has made its way into the DNA of the United States through him, and you can see it in his most famous bit of work, the Declaration of Independence, where he argued for the values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Another of the most influential men of modern times was Karl Marx, who did his PhD on Epicurus, and so it's not surprising to see that his utopia of communes bears a striking resemblance to the communal lifestyle of his ancient hero. And as an interesting counterpoint to these two, there is Nietzsche who admired Epicurus and said, For those with whom fate attempts improvisations, those who live in violent ages and depend on sudden and mercurial people, Stoicism may indeed be advisable, but anyone who foresees more or less that fate permits him to spin a long thread does well to make Epicurean arrangements. That is what all those have always done whose work is of the spirit. One of the goals of Nietzsche's life was to set up non-academic monasteries of the spirit, where the free spirits, the philosophers of tomorrow, would be educated and live in high commune. And you can see the strong dose of Epicurean DNA in, in that vision of Nietzsche's. So this Epicurean philosophy has a long reach despite being so brutally attacked and misunderstood in ancient times. It has influenced our modern thought through its greatest thinkers, and like Democritus, its materialist and egalitarian worldview bears a closer relation to our modern post-enlightenment world than any of the philosophers of antiquity. That's everything that I wanted to cover on this episode of The Living Philosophy. If you've enjoyed it, please subscribe if you haven't already, and I'd love to hear from you down in the comments if you have any thoughts, insights, or feedback. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.